Please meet Zach Roshan, who is managing partner at Metrics at Work, a really awesome engagement survey company that I've had the privilege of working with both when I was in the corporate side of things, as well as also now in my own business. In fact, Zach and his team have provided invaluable insight into books that you probably read of mine, such as our original Forever Recognize Others Greatness book. And I thought, who better to share some of the trends that have been happening over the period during COVID in 2022, and also perhaps help us understand what is going to happen in 2023. Thank you so much, Zach, for jumping into this conversation so quickly so that we can have have insight into what to expect. Thank you for joining me. Sure. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Happy to uh, provide whatever I can anyway. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's so great is that you have such a big portion of your data set that is healthcare, education, municipalities, and the, you know, the, the closer, the more regional government sector are not for profit community partners. And I know so many do not have the resources of a, maybe even their own HR team, let alone a fully staffed HR team that can do the deep dive. So for those of you who are watching this and you're from these, these public sectors and not for profit, you're definitely going to want to tune into this. Zach, I'm curious about when you looked at what was first happening in at the beginning of COVID, we actually had some interesting conversations of what engagement say, survey data was telling us and how that has shifted over that two year period. What are some of the key things that you've noticed that are really interesting to you? Um, so there's, there's a couple of different ways of looking at the data in engagement surveys. And one is by what we call an outcome. So like a big, Right, a big kind of overall how enthusiastic are people about their jobs or enthusiasm for the organization as an employer. And then there's all the different drivers, the levers you pull on, the things you act on. Mm -hmm. um, so in the first part of the pandemic, we actually saw some, some things going up, which we weren't expecting, and organizational engagement outcome. So, you know, that's like say, stay, strive, those sorts of questions. It's usually mm -hmm. three or five, you know. Up in. Um, it went up and and so there was there there was this sort of i was calling it the gratitude factor maybe mm -hmm. you know, and everybody was saying thank you back then signs and you know all this you know uh you know that was still going on or at least it was at the beginning i think it played into you know and, and, and other sectors that maybe aren't healthcare or frontline um we're still allowing people to work remotely, you know, because they had to. And so people were happy. And then in the end, people were also happy to have jobs because in, other, in some sectors people were, so I, I mean, that's the context that I don't know, but that was kind of what we thought because mm -hmm. there was, you know, this, this sort of higher enthusiasm and scores associated with sense of belonging in the organization and overall this organization cares about me. And I was so heartened to hear that when when we were talking back that I was I was thrilled a it reinforces the work that we do here at greatness magnified about the importance of recognition and meaningful connection and ensuring that people feel that their work matters so they feel that sense of belonging and that they feel included that they're more than a number and I love how you called it the gratitude effect. So I was hoping that this was going to maintain itself what what you know you're mentioning that the data has changed. Um, if we pause there for a second and we get into that good stuff, people are now on the on the edge of their seats. I'm curious for you, what did you expect would happen? If you if you rewind yourself back then, did you think, oh, now we have this higher level of organizational engagement and and connection? Did you think it would stay there, or were you like, no, I don't I don't think this is going to maintain? Well, I was surprised it, it went there anyway. Um, oh, okay, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't fluctuate too much. Like those are pretty pretty solid drivers in a database or outcomes rather in a database. Um, so I was surprised and, and anyway, I didn't know what was going to happen really. Mm. Um, but about a year later, so let's, I, I don't know if the that's bad news part of the conversation. Is this where we go into the bad news already? Well, about, about phase three of the pandemic, I guess, like, so the, I don't know how it coordinates with phases, but it dropped back down. Um, well, let me step back just a, just a moment because there was some other things that were that were different too. Um, you know, 
so people were more satisfied with recognition actually you know like that went up recognized. <laughs> yeah people felt more recognized so there was that mm -hmm. um, and some things fell to the bottom if we think about like what your lower hanging fruit or lower scoring areas were around the drivers and things that organizations act on did so those things that dropped right away were things like workload manageability mm -hmm. uh work-life balance um at first those were the two sort of main things and, and 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 that's you know if you think about engagement surveys you usually see recognition in the bottom opportunities for advancement some other things and suddenly those things weren't sitting at the bottom they were somewhere up in the rankings and at the bottom some things shifted and that's sort of what it looked like at first higher organizational engagement but some other lower scores and some other like some even lower than normal scores in some other areas like workload manageability or, or work life balance um so it was kind of confusing to interpret but um as as the pandemic went on organizational engagement slipped um down and some other things went down to the bottom of those drivers and those predictors like trust and senior leadership mm -hmm. and senior mm -hmm. leadership so there's you know and and we had to start doing obviously during pandemic benchmarking because most ceos in a debrief would say yeah, but don't compare us to pre-pandemic because that we're looking bad you know we want to compare to during pandemic so we did that of course uh and it helped a bit but but you know there's there's always variability across organizations but for the most part what we were seeing was senior leadership uh was going down middle management was getting rated lower frontline supervisors stayed being rated really high collaboration between coworkers really high so some of those coping mechanisms and some of those things stayed really strong, but what joined the bottom was leadership and middle managers and then workload manageability and work-life balance and stress. And in the maybe fourth or fifth wave, by that point, we started measuring burnout and then burnout came in and it's at the bottom and it's what I'm calling a burnout sandwich because you've got burnout affecting your ability to maintain your physical well-being is usually lowest and then there's work-life balance workload manageability workload stress and then burnout affecting your psychological well-being yeah like a it's the burnout sandwich basically mm -hmm. um is what we're starting to see in particular in healthcare but across organizations well and, and you know i appreciate you providing the data because when folks call us and they say we really need some help with we're seeing lower trust than we've ever seen before. People have, uh, some of my clients this week have been calling it, we're having a trust crisis right now. So, you know, you sharing that data and how that's changed just validated what they're seeing is not just unique to a few of my clients, that we're seeing this on a broader base. Um, we're seeing that mental health and physical health continuing to, to dominate our conversations as a, as a population about how healthy people are. And as you say, you're seeing it right at a basic, level of how people are responding to on their engagement surveys. So what I'm curious about is um, if we're if we were to predict organizations that take this really seriously in 2023. So they've sat down with you. They've been seeing this change. They saw the gratitude effect and recognition being high and, and trust being being high. Then it started to shift. Recognition fell away. Uh, sense of connection to their organization, to senior leaders started to go down, burnout went up, you know, those things. And they and these folks are saying, that's concerning to me. We're going to do something differently. What would you expect based on your experience in, in doing this work for 20 years? What would you anticipate in people's responsiveness would be different? What will they be seeing and could expect? In, in, in engagement surveys in 2023 if they take this really seriously? Well, some questions around wellness and support for mental health. Mm -hmm. you, you sort of prefaced that, but you mentioned it already. Um, that's what I think. Um, more, more initiatives managing employee mental health, support for mental health, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially, especially in, in, in healthcare where things are overbooked and you know there's an inability to schedule things in like like surgeries and things like that so there's 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 also emotional effect on people's well-being in terms of the ability to to do their job to help people 
right? So, so, I, so these, this, this is driving some of that, I, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what organizations are going to do to react because this is in particular most acute in the last six months to a year. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't get to see always or until a company comes back to us to resurvey, we don't always see what's being done. So I don't, I don't have all the answers. That's for sure about what, what I'm, you know, what's going to happen. I, I can sense that we are, we are already adding things about well-being and mental health, support mm -hmm. for diversity and belonging. Mm -hmm. um, more and more questions around that are, are being added to surveys um, for sure. I think the other thing is, and what I do see through consulting and presenting results is a focus on the leaders though, mm -hmm. because when I talk about that burnout sandwich, if you look at, SLT groups, directors, and then managers or super frontline leaders, those sort of three kind of groupings in general, that burnout sandwich is even worse for them. Mm -hmm. So the employees are showing this overall. But when you look into the leaders, in particular middle management, mm -hmm. they're they're trying to pull the organization through and and they're, they're, there isn't the support and they don't have the resources or the staff. And you know, and, and so those. Those issues are really significant for the leaders. And these surveys, like, you know, they're not 360s. This isn't saying bad leaders, it's saying leaders that have groups, in particular clinical and hospitals or um, in child sector, or, you know, it depends on what they are, um, what, what sector rather, but lead, the leaders need more support. So I know organizations are already targeting sessions, you know, creating sessions and trying to, trying to help what they're gonna do <laughs> to help. I'm not sure, you know, certainly supporting one another better is the one human thing we can do, but uh, organizations, uh, I've yet to see what can be done, I think. It's such an invaluable connection that you've just pointed out there. And thank you for highlighting that subsection of the data that when we look at burnout and when we look at people's, their, their work-life balance or lack thereof, I don't know, if, can we actually use work-life balance anymore? Could, can we dispel that that's, can we dispel the myth that that's actually possible, let alone uh, realistic to think about? Um, but you know, that soapbox aside, it's so important that you've mentioned that our leaders, our senior leaders, our middle managers are exhausted. And so how do we ask them to address the burnout that exists everywhere with them being even have an even higher burnout level? And we don't often think about that, do we? We don't often have a lot of articles that talk about the burnout problem of managers. We talk about burnt out um, people at that frontline service delivery level. Mm -hmm. So when you, you know, when you present these results to well-meaning leaders and who really are surprised or they're concerned and they care, is there any advice that, or anything that you share to help them not feel like the blame and like that they've got a target on their back? Is there anything that is helpful for them to know? Because I bet you some of them are watching this this video and they're like well now i officially don't know what to do i'm burnt out great you reinforced it and they're burnt out and i don't know what to do what what do you say to to support or give give some line of sight for our burnt out exhausted leaders of these these organizations well first acknowledge it mm -hmm. um don't ignore it um you know, it shouldn't be blamed, but it feels like that. It feels like that when you get a report and you've got low scores or something and you're the leader of this group. So it feels evaluative, but it's, yeah. it's that your employees are struggling from, from an engagement perspective anyways. Yeah. Um, it's, it comes down to the core of humanity, which is trust and respect and fairness, really. You know, so through, given this is the context in which we come and live every day in this place, that is our workplace. You know, it's about trust and respect. So acknowledge it, be transparent, talk about it instead of not. I've heard from others, um, you know, different sectors and different organizations where leaders do this better or, or not as good. Yeah. And um, not managing the workload, not acknowledging it. You know, I've heard of some town halls where people are emotional talking about this and then senior leaders don't debrief after that. And don't get a chance to talk. They, you know, I've heard back that, oh, it wasn't talked about. I was like, oh, it wasn't talked about, because um, I might have been present in a town hall when some things were said. <clears throat> and you know, and, and and to be fair, I mean, these people are just trying to get through the day, uh, manage the operational side of business. 
but the people side is um you know goes lacking yeah. uh, to the operational side and i would say that you know acknowledge it among your leaders talk about it try to you know if if your organization is helping to do a session or a program where you might actually be able to work together to try to come up with ways that you can support one another better mm -hmm. that's great um but certainly be compassionate to the employees and mm -hmm. try to build trust as much as possible and that's more difficult as you go higher up in the hierarchy in middle management and senior leadership um, because you're less visible yeah and really through pandemics you're making decisions quick uh, without consultation with employees uh, so you're not able to be seen as visible or communicating well um, and that's why some of those ratings get go lower <laughs> so I have, I, it's not I, an easy thing to, to, to solve yeah, it's not, it's, you're right. It's not an easy problem to solve, which is why we need somebody like you who reviews millions of data points a year and somebody who, you know, like me, who, who, who has the privilege of serving thousands and thousands of leaders in any given week, you know, and to try to find some of these insights and solutions so that our, you know, all of you who are watching this video who are working so hard to, to do your best and you feel like it's still not enough, we're, we're A, we're telling you you're exactly sadly on message and that this is a shared reality. And also to your point, Zach, this was so invaluable, such great lessons and, and advice to folks is talk about it, acknowledge it, Maybe peer to peer um, identify that this is a shared issue and try to try to be supportive of that reality of where you're at right now. Um, it's 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 almost like this is if their trust is low and you're burnt out, there really is only only trust building to go. So I mean, I it's it sounds trite to say, well, you can't get any lower once you're at the bottom. However. The, the flip side of failing, the flip side of that is that it can get us excited to connect on that human to human level. I mean, if we're all exhausted, if we're all burnt out, if we're all frustrated, if we're all worried about our own or somebody else's mental health that we love, if we're all worried that if something doesn't change, our physical health will deteriorate, if we're all worried that that we have this turnover crisis that's costing um, invaluable people to leave the industry in the sector. You know, these, this is a, this is a shared problem, a shared responsibility. Maybe, in fact, that vulnerability and that I don't have the answers. This is unprecedented. When have we ever had a global pandemic and in, out, out of control inflation and ridiculous housing prices and costs of living and, and a talent shortage and we had to homeschool our own children if we wanted to be teachers, we would have became teachers in the first place and all the other things that are coming down the pipe like recessions. If ever there's a time where we can say, I don't have, I nobody gave me the leadership course of leading through a pandemic and inflation and a recession and also teaching my children there was there's no leadership course for that so i actually i really welcome that advice that you you have for all of us is that you, you know share this talk about how it's hard talk about how it's not easy because if people are judging you and they're looking at you and they're frustrated and they're dissatisfied it can only be better if you say I, I hear you. I mean, I, I get it. I'm, 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 I'm struggling too, right? Like maybe people create solutions together with even with, with a frontline employee base too. That was the thing I just wrote down a, a moment ago was co-owned. I mean, peer to peer, peer to peer among leaders is what we were talking about. And that's important. Yeah. Um, but but the, the work environment is co-created yes. through through customers, patients, and 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 employees and leaders. So, so um, yeah, you know that that state of affairs is is what everybody walks into, whether you're a leader or an employee, when you're going into the office or into the emerge or or whatever your office is. Um, so so they're co-owned, and each each of you has different <laughs> different different reasons for being burnt out. Uh, and and personal lives and all of those sorts of things. So I think I think the transparency and acknowledgement. And I know in previous years and in, 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 you know before COVID and, and just in general, when when people talk about things uh, and then they resurvey, they tend to see things go up. You know, you said you can't go down. You know, there's nowhere to go but up. Mm -hmm. um, acknowledging that kind of result, whether it's about COVID or related to burnout or whether it's, you know, in general over the 20 years or more that I've been doing this, those acknowledgements and in, in, in conversation and open uh, openness uh, tend to garner more 
sense of belonging and and camaraderie like, and and togetherness. Yeah. Uh, and, and and that 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 can create sort of increase for better outcomes mm -hmm. uh, within the the realm of reality <laughs> within what's what's, what's right the, the context that we're the yeah, yeah. Context. Mm -hmm. <laughs> get more staff often or more more funds or whatever it is but um, so you have to do it on a human level yeah yeah and you know again full circle moment back to when we first started analyzing this data together and had the privilege of being able to share an analysis that you had never done before, where you separated out the least satisfied teams with recognition and the most. And we saw well before COVID, back when we thought Corona was a bad beer you had to cut with Lyme, there was a huge, dramatically, statistically significant difference in satisfaction with leaders, trust the organization, all the things we're talking about, right? Um, overall engagement, intention to stay, and continuous improvement. That was very different in high recognition teams from low. It made sense there. Of course, it's going to make all the more sense when people are extra stressed, resources are even more stretched, and we don't have this the certainty of what we can depend on in the future, we have to sometimes go back to basics. We've talked about co-creation, we've talked about honest conversations. Can we talk about, I know I'm biased, can we talk about recognition? Is there, is there a possibility if we, let's say every organization, and you, again, you're gonna have to brush off your crystal ball here, Zach, I know you normally review and paint the story of what you've seen. I'm also curious, based on your experience, if let's say organizations felt build, building peer-to-peer -peer recognition, maybe as a leader doing the best we can to recognize the person right in front of us, since your frontline supervisors are already highly it's high satisfaction, they're the ones seeing this. And also, if we if we focus on appreciating each other for what we're trying to do, which might help with burnout, right? It's like I'm going to recognize what is versus this, you know, focusing on what's what's sort of broken and how people aren't performing do you think that recognition would help even if it's just a little bit improve trust improve overall engagement improve satisfaction with leaders what's your hunch if you could crystal ball it yeah well i don't even have to really because okay good <laughs> bring bring back the gratitude factor it's not a, not on a societal basis not on the macro societal basis which is where it was coming from I think at first, when the organizational engagement outcome happened, we were socially recognizing a lot of the front line. Um, you know, and organizations just had to react. Um, but doing it more inside organizations, peer to peer, from leaders to front line employees, um, showing the recognition for what people are coming to in their day to day and getting through. Getting up and coming to work is a hard thing to do sometimes in some areas, in some workplaces. So recognizing that people are doing that and are you know doing it five days a week or more mm -hmm. uh, is is just a start. And if you you know and if you do that, it's it's inside that middle piece of society, which is our workplaces. Uh, it's instead of just societally, which is, and I, and I would, I would predict that we'll see, we would see the same sort of thing that in an organization that supports leaders or, you know, definitely reinforces leaders to do that, mm -hmm. uh, and employees among themselves too, that you would see that sense of belonging going back up, that organizational engagement going back up. I love, I thank you so much for, for, for prefacing it that it's almost like that's the model. That's what we see. And it was this this organic global wide recognition movement that came out of nowhere because we knew our basic human need and the only way we were going to be able to get to the biggest global healthcare crisis of our lifetime is if the people who are managing it who are trying to keep our our, our communities running who were providing care of course and and providing our essential services to people who most need us we knew on a human level that we needed to make sure that they felt appreciated, that they needed to feel like we were behind them, even if we physically weren't even at work with them or we you know, think lockdown was happening, we weren't there with them. So it's a beautiful call to action for asking everyone who's watching this, listening to this to say, what does the gratitude effect look like 
in your workplace where you have control? Maybe even what does the gratitude effect look like in your home, in your community, wherever you, you spend your time, your, your workplace, your community space, your home base? Because the more we build the gratitude effect into our every day, it's not like we have to wait for it to happen outside and, and whether it be a societal movement like what we saw, which was beautiful, but not sustainable, right? And also, I'm willing to bet it will help each person to feel like they have a bit more control over their own happiness, over their own satisfaction, over their own ability to feel grateful even when things are so perfectly imperfect. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that for people, like I hope that people can find their own gratitude movement within their own work and life. That's what I, that's what I hope. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, that's a great, a, a, a great uh, summary, I think, Sarah, <laughs> and, 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 and we, we often are, you know, centered into our own perception and worlds. So mm -hmm. to be open to noticing other people, and that's what we were talking about just before, noticing that someone else is struggling and saying, oh, you know, that's a great job, you know, or, or you did that, um, thank you, <laughs> and, that, and that's it. It's just a little bit more, more of that, um, yeah. And the great news is that costs nothing, takes virtually no time, and the more we forever recognize others' greatness, in other words, we're continually looking for evidence that people are doing the best they can, that they're doing well, that they're making a contribution, that they have strengths, the more it allows us to stay hopeful about the future, as well as to appreciate people and even ourselves in the moment. So I, I so appreciate your call to action, whether you plan to have it or not, around focusing on the gratitude effect as you're moving into 2023. I definitely think that when I would, I welcome us to have a conversation at the end of 2023 to review our predictions. Are you, I'm no, no uh, pressure. I'm going to put you on the spot. Can we chat in a year? and see how our predictions came that would, to be, that would be cool yeah let's see let's see what's what's going on in a year yes if changes or if uh, more of the same I, i'm curious i don't I, I i i think well the organizations we work with are very well meaning so i may, I may be biased but but i i, I think we're going to see things changing to the positive a little bit a little bit <laughs> Yeah. And you know what? Every day a little up, as they say in the lean continuous improvement world. So it's it's about bringing an intention because if we if we focus on everything, then nothing matters. If we don't focus on something, then we have no hope. So it's even if it's just a little little tweak, you've, you've given some great information around the drivers that have been impacted in when it comes to organizational and job engagement. So appreciate you sharing that. And I'm looking forward to bringing this conversation back in a year. And in the meantime, I hopefully the folks who are who have uh, chosen and given us the honor of their time uh, to focus on this, uh, folks feel a little clearer about what they do have control over. So I'm super appreciative uh, for you to share your expertise, your time, and have spent that that uh, little bit of extra work here preparing for our conversation to analyze that data. Um, if folks want to, to reach out to you, whether it be a little bit of consulting, perhaps even to relaunch their engagement surveys, if they haven't been doing them, if they have some questions about, about measuring engagement in their organizations, how can people reach you? Uh, we, have a, we have a website at metricsatwork.com. Uh, they can find a, a, a link to um, uh, get contacted by us. They can contact us through that, that website, um, certainly, or myself. Uh, my email at zak at metricsatwork.com. Just I love how you said uh, metrics at work. You almost could have been a radio announcer in a you know had you not become a psychometrist. Is that what is that what? The no, 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 psycho. I, yeah, well, I it's it's yeah. I mean, it, my training was in some other things <laughs> in some in some respects, but it, it went into psychometrics and uh, yeah and uh, organizational psychology for sure. And for uh, the benefit of you staying right to the end, I'll give you the inside scoop. Zach and I met in our undergrad. So we we lived through the joy of being in university in the 90s. Can you believe it was the 90s that we went to school? Like, how is it possible we're that old, Zach? Unbelievable. It was when, when, when we had to open up books to find articles right, right before the databases launched. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's 
Yeah. And we'd go to the bookstore and we'd have to stand in line for hours and hours. And then it'd be like, here's the textbook and here's a CD-ROM if you want to get really fancy. And nobody ever had enough money for those super fancy CD-ROMs. Now you can't even get a pipe by a computer that could use a CD-ROM. Hilarious, eh? Yes, Sorry. Yeah. That was a bit of a depressing downer when we... <laughs> I was going to end on one thing and I'll bring it back up. Yes! Uh, it's that... You know, we've been talking about, you know, as, as if everyone's stressed, as if everyone is burnt out, but there is variability in every result in, in, in organizations. And there are some teams, and I'll use the measure of morale, for example, where, where overall morale is good. Um, and where morale is strong or rated as good, it's usually because a lot of other things are good, like trust and leadership, like, like um, you know, workload is, is more manageable and things like that. So I would reiterate that, you know, for every two thirds of groups within organizations that are the burnout sandwich, there's usually one third of the group that's not, and that's strong. And that may have practices that could be shared uh, with others inside organizations, or just that um, we should understand that the f not every group in an organization looks the same. Yeah. So, so, so there's, there's lots of positive stuff already in workplaces that we see in the data. Yeah. Um, it's just that it's, to the point of almost alarming how how uh, poignant some of these things are like like stress and workload and burnout great reminder as our final call to action for folks is that if you're not sure what to do next and if you don't have hope and if you feel exhausted turn to somebody whose results and or even just their their approach would indicate that likely their results is that things are going well and simply ask tell me what's going on, what are you doing, what's working? And that is a beautiful solution focused, positive inquiry approach to um, understanding the great sides of what happens in every organization and in any team, no matter what context uh, is happening around us. So thank you for that beautiful way to, positive way, and for bringing us back up to, uh, to end our conversation. Zach, thank you so much for your time, for what you're doing in the world, and the type of person that you are to make sure that nobody in the boardroom when you present the results feel like they're to blame and that you always make sure that they feel that there is something that they have control over and that they're doing the best they can. What a gift. Well, we hope so. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Stay safe and uh, let us know what your questions are and we will be sure to answer them.